So anyone who hasn't registered, please see Lillian during lunch and complete your registration. Our next speaker is Nina Aganagic from uh, UC Berkeley. We'll talk about mock categorification from geometry by string theory. Okay, well, um, I'm really thrilled to be here in Edinburgh um, for the first time. And, um, uh, well, thank you for having a wonderful conversation. Okay, so uh, this will be uh, based on joint work um, with Akunko and also some work up here. Um, okay, so what I'll do is I'll explain um, two geometric approaches to um, the not verification problem, um, more, uh, how they follow from string theory. So one of the approaches um, will um, turn out to be uh, the same as um, uh, as that of comments and cowardice, uh, he says you have the same flavor. It will actually turn out to be basically the same as comments and cowardice. Although um, we will not use that work, so uh, it will it will simply emerge from um, uh, from, from, from physics. Um, the other is uh, related to it, uh, um, but there is related to um, the approach of Seidel and Smith, um, as related uh, in a uh, in a it's related in a precise in a precise way, though it's also distinct from it. So, just a couple of phrases. What, what is the difference? Of I will tell you about it. Oh, this okay. is what it talks okay. about. <laughs> 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 so, um, the string theory also uh, predicts relation between these two approaches, and um, uh, you'll see it's a variant of two-dimensional mirror symmetry. So, um, to answer uh, Ivan, so this will be a story from the beginning. So, if you are not familiar with these approaches, um, you, you don't need to know it. Um, all right, um, there's a third approach uh, to the <coughs> categorification problem um, that has the same uh, string theory origin <coughs> and is due to uh, Edward Witten. And so, uh, again, it has the same origin as the other two, as, as it turns out. So what emerges is a unified um, view of the, of the, of, of the not categorification uh, problem and so Okay, so um, to, um, it's useful to, to, uh, to review um, some very well-known aspects of notch invariance, and I'm reviewing them in the language that will be useful for us in what follows. So even though this is familiar, um, uh, it is important to do it. Um, so anyway, uh, so um, a quantum invariant of a knot, um, to get one, one starts with the Lie algebra, um, which will denote here by LG, L is for Langlands, even though uh, Langlands, um, for most of the talk, we'll take G or LG to be a simple lazy algebra, so you can forget about the, the L. Um, anyway, so we uh, we start with uh, with the real algebra G and um, and coloring of uh, the strands of the knot uh, with these representations. Um, so um, the link invariant, in addition to the choice of the group and representations, depend uh, depends on one parameter, uh, which is uh, do I have a pointer here? Which is or which is uh, kappa or or q. Now, uh, as is well known, uh, Witten uh, explained in his in his famous uh, paper from from eighty nine that um, the knot invariant um, comes from Trisimus theory with gauge group that is uh, based on the on um, the Lie algebra LG and effective Trisimus level kappa. Now. In the very same paper, he also shows that underlying uh, transcendence theory is a two-dimensional conformal field theory with um, affine current algebra symmetry, LG hat, at level two. So the level 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 kappa is a positive integer? Aha, uh -huh, very good. So I'm going to be loose about it. In, of course, in the Witten story, kappa uh, was a positive integer. Um, actually, in the way it's going to emerge from, from physics later on, kappa will be just an arbitrary complex number. So, um, <laughs> um, the space of conformal blocks of LG hat on a Riemann surface with punctures um, is the Hilbert space of Trisimus theory on A times time. To um, eventually get invariants of knots on, on, on R3 or on S3, it, uh, we want to take um, A to be a complex plane with punctures. Now, conformally, in a wooden story would have been equivalent to take it to be a, a punctured infinite cylinder. 
for the configuration problem, it will turn out to be crucial that it's a function if it's order. But um, again, that, that, that is in the end how the story will emerge. Um, so, so you allow an arbitrary number of functions? Uh, we'll take an arbitrary number of functions, yes. <laughs> um, so corresponding to um, conformal blocks of the f final Lie algebra, um, um, on the streamers on this setting, uh, uh, correlators of Carl vertex operators on, on A. Um, now, um, the functors at zero at infinity are special. They are labeled by a pair of highest weight vector vectors of Riemann modular representations of the algebra. So mu and mu prime are um, just, um, um, they're, they're arbitrary levels, right? No, there's, there's nothing integral about them. Um, chiral vertex operators at finite points are, are labeled <coughs> by uh, finite dimensional representations of, of, of the algebra. Um, and they act as intertwiners between a pair of Verman modular representations. Um, the space, so you sew it all up together in a, um, uh, as follows, and um, the space of conformal blocks that you get um, is a vector space. Um, it's um, a subspace of the representation, uh, tensor product of all the representations of finite forms. Okay, can I interrupt you again? Mm -hmm. What do you mean by intertwiner between the Verma models? Huh? So you really mean? You really mean it just just the intertwiner? Morphism from perturbation. Sorry? Morphism from perturbation, yeah. though, yeah. but they are not many, right? Well, it's, it's uh, the, 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 exactly. So if you um, if uh, if you pick mu and and, and uh, mu one and mu two, it's a finite dimensional space. Or sometimes one dimensional, sometimes zero. Okay. Exactly. And the way you get a finite dimensional space is precisely by suing Carl vertex operators. You get a space whose um, um, it's a subspace of this representation of weight on uh, mu minus mu prime. So the way you really want to think of it is you want to fix uh, you want to fix uh, one of the weights. And uh, pick a weight subspace, and that that determines in front. So um, the the finite dimensional space comes from um, uh, the space of choices of intermediate Verma module um, representations as you, as you see here. Uh, again, it could be um, zero dimensional, but um, you of course you don't want to do that. So again, you pick the the, the way to think about it again is you pick mu. Pick a, a weight in the subspace of all the tensor product, and that determines mu prime. All right. Um, so, just how is path integral on A times the interval in the presence of a break uh, gives you um, the corresponding quantum Braden variant. Um, and the Braden variant um, is is a matrix that transports the space of conformal blocks uh, along the break. I'll transport the Hilbert space into time series um, along the break. Now, uh, if we want to, like, if you want to make this explicit, what it means to transport a um, space of conformal blocks along the break, then um, a different view of, um, it's helpful, it's not necessary, but it's helpful. Um, so instead of um, thinking about conformal blocks in terms of vertex operators in sewing, where, for example, the fact that level k um, on kappa is an integer is crucial, uh, we can describe them as uh, solution. We can as solutions to differential equations. In which case, um, the fact that uh, level kappa is an integer is not crucial anymore. So the equation that I solve is a Knizhny homological equation. So from this perspective, uh, the invariant of the break is monodromy of the Knizhny homological equation along the path and parameter space corresponding to the break. So uh, the monotomy problem uh, was famously solved by uh, Grinfeld and Kona, um, and they showed that a monotomy matrices are given in terms of R matrices of the DOQ uh, final group. So um, the action of monotomies on the space of conformal blocks um, um, turns the, the space of conformal blocks into a module for DOQ um, of LG in their quantum group of the quantum group in this representation. So here uh, we'll view um, the representations as representations of UQ and not of LG, um, but we'll still be not by the same letter. 
So um, this monotony matrix is um, is acts irreducibly only if you fix the total weight. Um, so <coughs> and um, the way we set up the problem, um, the acts irreducibly in the in the, in in the subspace uh, determined by um, the pair of weights at the at zero and infinity. So is the number of punctures equal to the Number of in the it's the number of strengths, that's right. It's the number that you get to pick. And you also get to pick, uh, you also get to pick representation things. And um, the, the choice of mu and mu prime um, arises in also in Richard Deakin uh, to arrive description as well. Um, crucially efforts um, to so the R matrices. Huh? The breaks in the R numbers, they're not on the D. Aha, good. So, in principle, you could get a bigger braid group by considering braiding um, a basically affine braid group. We'll only use the finite carter. So it's a <laughs> the reason that this setup might look strange is that or this is how it arises from physics. So in some ways, the the most um, interesting aspect of the story is that in studying categorification problem, categorification of say not invariants. You have to make some guesses. You have to guess the solution and then show it that it works. The advantage of this approach is that is that um, the fact that you get the right categorification is manifest for the, from the outset. But it also means that some choices that you might have been free to make if you're guessing, you're not free to make. Okay. They just come. Um, Even trigonometric KZ is very much physical, right? Huh? Even KZD is very much physical. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. But the physics we are talking about here is the physics of supersymmetric string theory and supersymmetric H theory. It's not a physical transformation theory. Okay. Anyway, so this gives you, um, of course, not just braid invariance, but also link and not invariance. So um, <coughs> any link can be represented as a closure of some braid. Um, and then the corresponding link invariant is simply a matrix element of the Brady matrix between a pair of conformal blocks. <coughs> um, so the conformal blocks, in the, the way I'm writing it, time runs um, vertically and um, they correspond to the top and the bottom of the picture. And obviously you want to get, a, to get an invariant of a link, you want, to, um, you want to choose specific conformal blocks. In other words, specific solutions of the Keynesian zeomological equation that um, describe um, pairwise fusing of vertex operators into copies of trivial representations. So, if you really want to close knots and links, this um, you want to restrict this um, subspace um, of the representation space of width of width zero. Okay. Now. If we wanted to, um, to, to, so to categorify um, uh, link and not invariants, one would like to associate to a space of conformal blocks that you get at a fixed uh, time, uh, a bidrated category, and um, to each conformal block, an object of that category. To braids, you'd like to associate functors between categories corresponding to the uh, bottom and the top, and moreover, you'd like to do it in a way that recovers um, quantum not invariance of the categorification. So, as I said a little while ago, so you typically approach this problem by coming up with a category, and then you work um, to prove that decategorification um, gives you um, the quantum invariance you aim to categorify. So, in the first, in those two geometric approaches that I'll describe, the second step is automatic. <clears throat> so the starting point will be um, a geometric realization of conformal blocks, and one that comes from um, supersymmetric um, quantum field theory and from string theory. So, in fact, um, we'll find two such interpretations. It will lead to two geometric descriptions of the um, of, um, categorical non-invariants. <coughs> and um, both are new. Um, now, they're new, um, uh, well, 
<laughs> then I knew that in the rise from the story of the hundred. Um, now, um, so we could just simply start and tell you what the story is, but I think it's better um, to to uh, to start it by asking a slightly different question first, because in part because this is how we discovered it, um, and and um, in part because some aspects of the story are perhaps easier. Um, well, because that's how we discovered it. Anyway, so it's useful to ask for geometric interpretations of few conformal blocks of the quantum affine algebra, which is a few deformation of the affine Lie algebra. Um, so these few deformed conformal blocks are were discovered by um, Igor Frankel and um, and uh, Nikolai Rostikin. Um, so they can be defined analogously to the conformal flight case as correlators of chiral vertex operators, except the operators are deformed and um, the algebra is deformed. And just like in conformal case, um, they may be defined as solutions uh, um, of quantum conditions in a logical equation, an equation that is a Q deformation um, of the conditions in a logical equation. So in fact, this is how the story was um, was discovered by, by Franklin and Rishitikin by starting with the equation and then discovering that all of the structures of conformal field theory miraculously generalize. So um, this uh, QKC equation is a difference equation um, which reduces to Knizia's homological equation in a limit. So it's a difference equation with um, step P And um, not, and so there, there is a, there is a, there is a limit where uh, we take p to one, and um, and the parameter h bar of the of the deformation of the deformation of the um, affine Lie algebra to one uh, in such a way uh, that um, keeping kappa fixed. So we'll we'll discuss it with what this limit is in, in a little while. So now it turns out that um, few conformal blocks of the quantum affine algebra have a geometric uh, a realization, and it's simpler because it comes it's it's somewhat simpler than um, in the affine the algebra case. As it is now. It's simpler because it comes from supersymmetric gauge theory. And so um, so from now on we'll take um, G to be simply laced. So it's of AD um, We could describe um, how the story generalizes to non cases, cases, but um, it's more complicated, um, and uh, well, it's somewhat more complicated, and we we'll certainly won't have time for it. So the gauge theory we'll need is a three-dimensional gauge theory, uh, quiver gauge theory, with n equals to four supersymmetry. So the quiver um, that defines the theory well, as always, is a collection of nodes and arrows um, between them. So the quiver will be based on the Dinkin diagram of the Lie algebra. Um, well, for, for eventual generalization, anyway, um, to the non-simple lace cases, um, the Lie algebra here, um, more closely related to the Langlois dual we all Of course, here for us, LG and G are the same. And, um, um, so. Anyway, so the quiver uh, encodes the, um, the gauge and global symmetry groups and, uh, and representations and, um, of the matter field that are charged on them in the usual way. This is probably familiar to most. Now, which quiver should we take? Um, so the dimensions uh, of the ranks of the vector spaces associated to the nodes are determined by, by pairs of weights of the of the representation of the of um, um, u q l g hat, uh, in which the q conformal blocks transform. Um, so the, um, the the flavor nodes are determined by uh, the the ranks of the, on the flavor nodes are determined by the highest weight, and the ranks of the gauge nodes. Um, can be um, are, are fixed once you pick which weight um, 
So um, Richard and Gage don't get a two year <laughs> well, the, the 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 gauge notes are the ones with the, uh, with, the, with, the, with the links between them associated with. Them. <coughs> exactly. The, it's the it's the it's the finite uh, type quiver that enters, not the affine. Type. Um, so, um, so it, it, the the solutions of the of the of the two KZ equation turn out to be a supersymmetric partition functions of this three dimensional gauge theory on um, on um, on disk <coughs> an infinite disk times S one. Um, and um, well, uh, to, to which partition function we'll need? Um, so we'll we'll it, as it turns out. Um, well, this this is for for, for, for people who for experts. Um, the 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 theory has a SU two. Um, it has a pair of SU two R symmetries, and um, and uh, it turns out if you want to use only a U one times U one subgroup of them to define the partition. So uh, what this does um, is um, it it's, it treats the the two um, the it, it treats the two uh, R symmetry groups symmetrically. Anyway, so all the so now it turns out that all the ingredients of the Pukin formal block have a gauge theory interpretation. So um, I mean, so if the connection goes through super potentials, uh, just a couple of bits about the connection. No. No. It's the partition function of the gauge here. The supersymmetric partition function no, of the gauge here. Without using the super, super, super potential. Without using. No, it's here we are using a full gauge. Theory. There's no, uh, not just a. It's uh, gauge theory is just simple, right? Because in some sense they're linear theories. Um, Can you say then how I get the partition function from the trivial repetition? Right. Um, so here I, I didn't say it yet. <laughs> okay. Right. So here's what you do. So. Um, so you study the, the theory on uh, on this infinite disk times the circle, and um, um, so uh, so the the geometrically what you do is the following uh, is that um, you, you define the partition function so that as you go around the circle, the disk rotates with step p, p with parameter p, which is the step of the difference equation. Okay. So the step of the difference equation ends, enters geometrically. Uh, and now, if you were to do just that and nothing else, you break supersymmetry. Uh, to preserve it, you need to accompany this um, uh, rotation of the disk as you go around the circle by a uh, rotation um, of, by, a hol by turning on holonomy in the, uh, of one of the U1Rs. Um, the parameter h bar turn corresponds to turning on a second uh, holonomy around the of um, well, it's really a, um, a diagonal combination of these two U1R symmetries, which turns it to, into a global symmetry. Um, I'll say what this is in a, in, in a math language in, in a moment. So, um, the, also um, in, in a moment. So, also uh, you turn on um, um, holonomy is associated with the global symmetries. Uh, so uh, you have as many um, the ranks of these vector spaces. The green ones, the total rank, is exactly the number of vertex operators. So you have a parameter for each vertex operator. And uh, in physics, these are some mass parameters. Um, <coughs> um, so uh, the, 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 the highest weight vector of the Brahman module is related to um, the, the holonomy of a global symmetry associated with phi the Lockwood parameter around the circle. So this is how it's derived from physics. Now, um, it, fortunately, <laughs> the, the same um, um, physics words are just said have a precise mathematical uh, formulation in terms of quantum K theory of Nakajima quiver variety X. So what's X? So X is, um, um, well, X is just an, the quiver variety that Nakajima would have associated to the same quiver data. Um, from physics perspective, it's what's called the Higgs branch of the gauge theory. Um, 
So S is just, uh, you take uh, the representation space um, of the quiver, take a T star of it, and then, uh, and then uh, take a hypercalic quotient uh, by the H quiver. Okay, so, um, so the, the variant of quantum tree theory we need is the one um, that, that was developed um, uh, by Okupa uh, with Malik and Smirnov. Um, it's a cousin of the theory that the Givental um, developed, um, that Givental introduced, original in fact. Um, but it works, it, it, it works for homomorphic symplectic varieties like X. Um, rather, the formulation of it uses crucially the fact that X is homomorphic symplectic. So the supersymmetric partition function of the gauge theory in the setting on this times on this infinite disk times S1, is uh, what um, Akukov and, and um, calls a, a k theoretic vertex function uh, of x. So <laughs> it's a generating function of equivariant k theoretic counts of quasi maps from this to x of all degrees. Uh, you work equivariantly with respect to, um, well, maximal torus of rotations of x that preserve the homomorphic symplectic form. The parameter h bar that enters the quantum affine algebra in the formation um, scales the homomorphic symplectic form. And you also work equivariantly with respect to the rotations of the domain curve um, P. So this is just math rephrasing of what um, physics partition function is. Um, it's funny that, that X is this cotangent bundle mondo. That's right. Well, the, it's the Nakajima quiver ride. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, the, the same axis, um, <coughs> entered the, 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 the story of quantum and fine algebra long ago, in fact, in the work of Nakajima, um, where, um, he showed that quantum and fine algebra acts on classical K theory of X. Here we're using quantum K theory of X. In other words, uh, something that, that more, is more sensitive to, to maps to X from real systems. And, not, um, and it's not just a classical algebra. So, uh, what Rukukov shows, uh, and this is um, the, the sort of, this is the hardest theorem in, 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 in the subject, is that this K theoretic vertex function of X solves the quantum Kinesian semi-logical equation corresponding to. Um, um, the quantum of fine algebra. Which solution um, it computes, so which Q conformal block you get, depends on the choice of data at infinity of this disk. And um, so this means that um, 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 these, these vertex functions are, 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 are valued in, um, <coughs> in equivalent elliptic cohomology. So that what T is? Uh -huh. So T is just the torus of, uh, of of equivariant parameters that we are that failed of, of that, that we are working with. So um, basically, all is, you're working with respect to all the global symmetries of X. Um, <coughs> eventually, <coughs> eventually, when we all the global symmetries of X. So these these uh, these global symmetries. Encompassing them from representation theory perspective, the parameter h bar of the, of the deformation of the affine the algebra to the quantum affine one, and also um, the, um, <coughs> the the choices <laughs> at, at zero that, that, that you make it at zero. At so, Sorry, from, can you say what that elliptic curve is? What's this elliptic curve is? Yes. <laughs> so remember, <laughs> here it's not visible, right? Uh, but it. Um, well, it's visible in the sense that um, um, the story takes place in K theory, right? Um, and and um, well, okay. The best way to say it is this: from from physics perspective, the, you have a gauge theory on disk times S one, and the boundary at infinity is a torus. It's the, uh, it's effectively it's the effective complex structure modulus of that torus at infinity. That's the logic. And that's why elliptic homology. 
And, uh, and so, so notice that the zero and infinity here enter differently. Um, uh, the, the, the <coughs> corresponding to the, the fact that um, conformal blocks are, are, are um, the space of conformal blocks is, even in the conformal case, is acted on by, uh, by u q of g hat. And uh, U Q of G and well is what 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 uh, what enters here is that just affine or just even a finite particle of the algebra. Um, uh, correspondingly, the 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 the, the um, to actually get each of these guys to be a vector, you need to you need to also insert something here at the origin, right? What you insert at, at the origin is valid in in equivariant k zero x because there this circle this circle is missing. Here. <laughs> That's hard to see. Um. So um. Now, what? So, in some sense, once you prove this hard theorem, um, the fact <laughs> that you get solutions of the QKZ equation comes for free, uh, for free at the price of the hard theorem. Um, however, while you get solutions of the QKZ equation, you don't get Q-conformal blocks. <coughs> um, what does it mean? They satisfy the same equation? They satisfy, so what does it mean? To get a Q-conformal block, uh, Q-conformal blocks are analytic in a choice in a chamber corresponding to yeah. the choice of ordering of vertex operators. Um, so this choice of ordering of vertex operators, um, well, the positions of vertex operators are equivalent parameters of X. In this enumerative approach uh, to QKZ, there's no analyticity whatsoever in terms of equivariant parameters of X. Instead, there's um, analyticity in terms of um, KLA module of X, which is the data associated to, say, um, one of the punctures, um, the puncture zero. <coughs> and uh, these parameters are finally alpha's parameters with respect to the gauge there. So, you get an answer, uh, but not quite to the uh, to the question we wanted. So, now it turns out that not all is lost, but there's um, there uh, there is there's in fact a second geometry um, that enters um, the, um, the problem, um, and the the second way to get um, solutions of QKZ equations from geometry, which will be the one that's relevant. Um, to, to, to conformal and cuboconformal blocks. So, um, to a three dimensional quiver gauge theory, there are actually not one, um, but two homomorphic symplectic varieties um, that one can associate. So, uh, one we already met, it's the Nakajima quiver variety, which physicists would call a Higgs branch. The other one is the Coulomb branch, which will denote by X check. And I think Coulomb branch will feature in many talks. So, um, the Coulomb branch is, um, 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 well, one way to say what it is, is an intersection of slices uh, in a thick affine Grassmannian of G. Um, so, um, so it's an intersection of a pair of orbits associated with lambda and nu um, um, that define both the conformal blocks and the quiver. Um, if you haven't seen this before, it's too much, so I will, I will, I will, I will not um, <laughs> go through this in detail. It turns out that there's another way of thinking about X, which I'll, I'll mention in a moment. So, for now, we get two homomorphic symplectic varieties, the X and the X check. Um, um, they, they turn out to live in different dimensions, um, and uh, between them, um, roles of Kähler and equivariant parameters get exchanged. So. If um, if A was the space where vertex operators lived, and lambda was um, basically the, the weight space where um, the if A was the space where positions of vertex operators lived, and lambda was the weight space that um, the weight the space where the weight of um, at zero um, <coughs> lived, between X and X check, their roles get exchanged. So. Um, the, the Kähler modulo of x, or equivariant modulo of x check, and vice versa. <coughs> now, um, this other way 
kept advertising uh, of thinking about abstract, um, is that the modular space of G manifolds on R times C, um, where um, where uh, you use well, eventually to get um, remember we use the symmetry that scale the holomorphic symplectic form uh, on X on an abstract uh, by parameter H bar. That symmetry gets related to uh, rotations of one of the complex planes. So you break up the space in which the manifolds live, which starts with R three. You break it up into R times C. And then um, lambda is the charge of singular manifolds, and nu um, is um, the total manifold charge. So in this language of manifolds, um, the positions of vertex operators on our Riemann surface are positions of singular manifolds on R. And to preserve this um, symmetry, we need to use, um, uh, in our application, all the manifolds sit at the origin of the complex. Um, and um, the fact that, um, well, so anyway, so as so X check then is a is a is a moduli space of, of manifolds um, in this in this fashion. So um, it's known that um, <coughs> um, that from for physics that there is something called three dimensional mirror symmetry, which uh, sometimes um, uh, lets you um, answer. A given question, either from perspective of X or from perspective of X check. Um, so, um, so, from, so <coughs> in this case, one expects to be able to compute supersymmetric partition function of the gauge theory on this uh, infinite di um, on disk times S one by starting with the sigma model on either X or on X check with suitable boundary conditions of infinity. Now, if either if if the space we wanted to study the gauge theory on were actually compact, uh, if you didn't have a boundary at infinity, then um, the partition functions computed either by x or by x check would have been exactly the same on the node. Here uh, we have that at infinity um, as well, and so um, you will need to understand how to map boundary conditions based on x to boundary conditions based on x check. So the story is a little more interesting. And um, it's precisely that fact. Um, so the fact that you can uh, use either x or x check translates into the question that um, vertex function is based on either of x check or an x solve the same Cupid's equation. Um, and with, uh, with Andre, we prove that whenever you can define it, um, k theoretic vertex function of x check, it solves the same Cupid's equation. Um, this is actually more restrictive than, than, than I made it sound here um, because um, for some technical reasons, but you can ask me about it later. Anyway, so, um, so from pr perspective of, of X check, uh, the, the QKZ equation <coughs> is, um, uh, is a quantum difference equation because the A variables, the positions of vertex operators, um, a Kähler variables of X check. So um, this quantum difference equation is a K-theory analog of Eventhal's um, quantum differential equation. Um, and um, quantum in that in that story, uh, um, quantum differential equation and quantum difference equation uh, refers to the fact that to define it, I need to use quantum homology cup product on on X check. Um, so could you do everything in formation so that it's Aha, uh -huh. that's it. I'm getting there. Right. So while now while they saw the, the vertex functions on both sides, they solve the same Cuca's equation, they give two different basic <coughs> solutions by their origin in the numerical geometry. So vertex functions of X give solutions of Cuca's equation which are analytic in the Z variables. Z variables are the ones that have to do with the weight of the Raman module, and not a, they are not interesting from perspective of conformal blocks. Uh, th so they're analytic in the Z variables, but they're crucially not analytic in the A variables. While the vertex function of X check does exact opposite. Um, so um, the Z variables are Kähler variables of X and equivariant for X check. 
and similar to the A variables, the scalar variables of that set. So since it comes from a numerative geometry, you're going to get something that's analytic and scalar variables. Um, uh, you're counting maps and A variables keep track of the degrees of maps. So analyticity yes, remark, from so perspective the, hub, the main variable. application of the high is uh, solutions which are analytic in both in Z and in A variables. Right? There are no solutions that, no things that this, this there are no solutions that analytic. analytic no, 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 no. Global, global, uh, global uh, happy geometric, you have to There is no such thing. They are they doing this. <laughs> I, okay, we can talk this about this. This is the main absurdity number one application of that analytic application. Uh, I, I don't believe the such thing. And symmetry, x, x a symmetry. There is so the, the, the fact that you're solving the same equation, but you're getting two different bases um, of its solutions, and the relation between them is highly non-trivial. Yes, because you do, you don't use global the story about global <laughs> have to do you have to okay. do with it. But yeah, we'll talk anyway, so um, now our main interest is uh, is finding actually geometric realization of conformal blocks of the F on Lie algebra. So um, the so. The conformal limit is the one in which, well, is quantum affine algebra becomes ordinary affine Lie algebra, and correspondingly the QKZ equation becomes KZ equation. <coughs> so you take a, this parameter h bar goes to one, the step p of the difference equation also goes to one, but you keep kappa fixed. And to get KZ equation from QKZ equation, you also need to take Z to 1 in a special way where it's actually this parameter mu that's the weight of the Verma module. Um, so you take these to 1, keeping kappa A and mu fixed. So the mouse is saying that we're keeping the data of the conformal block fixed. Now, for its by its nature, because it takes Z variables to 1, keeping positions of vertex operators to A variables fixed, the limit treats x and x check differently. Um, so the z variables are Kähler variables for x. So actually, let's let's start with this end. So uh, z. Uh, so the limit is not perspective, uh, not geometric from perspective of x, because it takes z to one, and z are Kähler variables of x. So that means that um, the nakajima Kleber variety is, um, has no information about, um, uh, um, about conformal blocks of the affine Lie algebra. Um, in the z to 1 limit, it becomes very singular. And um, everything that we know about x um, goes out of it. By contrast, from perspective of the Coulomb branch, x check, the limit is perfectly geometric. So the A variables are uh, its scalar variables, and um, those we keep fixed. So from perspective of abstract, um, this is, is the question, answer to Katarina's question, this conformal limit is simply the cohomological limit that replaces quantum k theory of x check with quantum cohomology of x check. You know, the, the interest of application is uh, for a fine grassman, is also quite uh, complicated from the viewpoint of the great geometry. Sorry, what? Uh, you mean compactification of a fine and whatever, that's my interest. This is Greenfield's compactification. It, it is quite complicated, actually. So it's single, singular, right? We're, we're not compacted by anything. So for us, x is the modular space of monopoles and r3. Uh, Extract is the modular space of monopoles and r3, and it's not. <coughs> um, so the Canadian zymological equation that we get is simply the quantum differential equation of x check um, in given tall sense. So, uh, conformal blocks of homological vertex functions um, are uh, given called J functions, if you want, <coughs> computed by the variant gram of Witten theory of x check. <coughs> um, so you count home, so mm, this vertex function counts holomorphic maps from um, <coughs> from infinite disk to x check, where you work equivariantly with respect to now the dual torus um, that uh, encodes the weights of the Verma module and on. Um, What's left of um, and uh, and it scales the holomorphic symplectic form of x check with parameter q. Um, I didn't quite explain why it comes out, but it just simply comes out from the you know the precise limit you are taking and taking quantum k theory to quantum homology. Um, um, it's uh, so remind me the number of nodes in the Dinkin diagram was the number of vertex operators. No, the number of the, the Dinkin diagram is that of the Lie algebra that we started. Yeah. It's just which knot invariance we want to start. Okay. The ranks 
uh, so then we have to in, in, in quiver you have to say um, you have to say what are the ranks in the various nodes uh, and those get related into which which conformal blocks you want to study which conformal blocks of badly algebra you want to study so, so this tor t check is acting more like a GLN t check. No, so this t check acts generally an x check. So, so the, the suggested variance um, scaling for x check. Uh, <coughs> um. So, um, right. The, the, remember, in, in the old story where we had Nakajima quiver variety. The torus that was acting on X had to do with positions of vertex operators. And this is a different torus, like the dual torus, related to it by mirror symmetry. Um, yeah. Anyway. But why don't you get a uh, Yang Yang instead of a quantum alpha? Ah, <coughs> because, uh, so, um, <coughs> you would get, uh, but because the limit we are taking is not a gauge theorem, there's another limit you could have taken from, if we took the, uh, if we took the analogous limit from perspective of x, not from perspective of x check, we would have gotten the angle. Oh. Right. Yeah, so you need a x symmetry. A simple answer, you need a and x to be on equal ground. I mean, a uh, parameters, uh, Cologne and uh, just uh, some kind of... They're symmetry. not on equal ground. Because, uh, this is the only reason why you don't consider some trigonometric or rational reason, because you'll destroy the symmetry between them. Uh, am I right? Huh? Like, we are, so you you've, you've gone, you've gone from QKZ to KZ, you destroy, destroy the symmetry. Yeah, you don't want to destroy I do destroy. I have but to destroy. If you consider, why, why not to consider that Monica, which Monica suggests, consider some limits to young girls? Uh, because I want to get not invariance. Hmm? I want to get not invariance. Ah, okay. okay. So, so you um, can go to rational data and still you, you can catch some, some I want to get not invariance. I want to get transformance invariance or not. I don't want to get something else. Okay. Um, so, um, so the, the main curve of, uh, so now we are studying um, just given tells problem, where, however, so you want to think, so you could have think of the domain as, um, as P1 with zero and infinity deleted, but it's better to think about the, 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 uh, the point at infinity as really a circle boundary at infinity. And to this boundary that, so the, the boundary data is a choice of a k-theory class in equivariant k-theory of extra. So this k-theory class, the choice of this k-theory class tells you which solution of the quantum differential equation um, the conformal blocks compute. Now, so what have we done? Um, the, the, so we've gotten another interpretation, a geometric interpretation of of conformal blocks. Now, uh, from, which comes from the A model of X-check. Now, what's crucial is that underlying this A model is actually a supersymmetric sigma model to X-check. And the supersymmetric sigma model has more information than just the A model that we start to, that, that we need to study to get conformal blocks. The, the more information uh, is in the following. Um, and, and what's the physical meaning of um, this vertex function? So it's a partition function of a supersymmetric sigma model on tar with target x check on this infinite cigar, where um, in the interior of the cigar, you have a type twist, but at a boundary at infinity, you place a b type boundary condition. For you to be able to do that, to impose b type boundary condition, it's crucial that d is an infinite cigar. Okay. Uh, that um, boundary condition corresponds to this um, um, uh, this choice of um, equivariant k-theory class. More precisely, the, bound, the beta boundary condition is a B-brain on X-check. It's an object of equivariant derived category of X-check. Um, which object do you pick? You pick the object whose k-theory class determines the vertex function you want. Okay, so in computation of conformal block, the only Data of the of the of the of the of the object is in the derived category used is just the k theory class. Um, so this says the same thing. But again, we are simply we are still at the level of numbers and conformal blocks. Now, we can ask more questions. So from perspective of X check, the action of braiding 
uh, is monodromy of the quantum differential equation along a path in its moduli space, in its scalar moduli. Um, and uh, it acts on the vertex functions via um, the action on, uh, uh, on the data of infinity, as, um, as monodromy does. It acts on the space of conformal blocks. And here it's the data at infinity. Um, now, uh, the, the theorem by Basil Kovnikov and Kunkov says that action of braiding on equivalent K theorem X of X check, whenever X check is holomorphic, uh, symplectic, and smooth, uh, leads to uh, derived auto equivalence functors of the equivalent derived category of X check. So, um, <clears throat> so it implies that. Uh, this derived auto equivalence functors of the equivalent um, derived category of abstract uh, categorify the action of UQ uh, of G R matrices on conformal blocks. <coughs> so, can, can no. you say what this means? So, what, what is the categorization here? So, the storage, everything so far was about the decategorified block. We discovered that we, we that, that conformal blocks come from the A model of X check. We discovered that um, the action of braid, the braid action of braiding of conform conformal blocks is monodromy of the of, of uh, quantum differential equation. Right? And what because the, the <coughs> because the story comes from the supersymmetric sigma model. You know what it what it happens when you cut. When you so the the, the 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 braiding the braiding matrix is the partition function of the of the of the of the, of the sigma model on on S one times an interval with beta boundary conditions at the two ends. Right? And if you want to decategorify this, you cut it open. You, you cut the, the cylinder open. And um, you have uh, you have uh, um, so this, you cut the cylinder open, and, uh, <coughs> and what you find is that the matrix element. Well, so so the matrix element is the partition function of a B-twisted sigma model on S check with a pair of B brains at the boundary. Okay, it's 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 B-twisted because the boundary condition is a B-type. And um, on um, and uh, because the brains pick out the B supersymmetry on the on the annulus, you actually have a B type supersymmetry um, B type sigma model. But the uh, categorification is categorification is just cutting this open, cutting the cylinder open um, along the circle. This, oh, okay. And uh, you find that so uh, that the corresponding um, uh, categorical leak invariant is the graded home. It's a space of uh, states of the of uh, that contributes uh, to the to that trace. So that space of trace are the x between the uh, the the brains um, at the two ends, computed in in a covariant derived category of, of x track. So in addition to homological grade. Uh, you get here a second grade that comes from um, Q, that comes from um, the, um, the T check, uh, <coughs> that comes from the covariant action on X check. What is it, when did I start and how much time do I have? Uh, eight minutes. Okay. <coughs> now, we get uh, <coughs> from the same three dimensional gauge theory, we actually end up getting a set. So, this is one description in terms of um, X check, which is um, closely, which, which is essentially what, what this distorted comment from Kautis had in type A. So, we get a second description, uh, which is as follows. So, it turns out that um, it leads to two dimensional equivariant mirror of X check. Um, and what this equivariant mirror is, is itself a new result. So the equivariant mirror, it turns out to be a lambda gisberg theory with, tar with a certain target, y, and a certain potential w. Um, both of them you can derive from the 3D gauge theory we started with um, as a limit of some simple um, <coughs> model calculation. But um, another way of, um, of, of, of discovering the mirror description is as follows. 
So recall this, um, the three to get a mesh gauge theory, starting with the Higgs branch and the Kojima Kriva variety, gives you um, 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 its k theoretic vertex functions that two conformal blocks. Now, if we take the conformal limit, the vertex function has no geometric interpretation in terms of x, uh, because x becomes singular. However, as solutions of differential of difference equations, <coughs> so there is <coughs> there um, in 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 um, computing the vertex function of x, um, you can um, you can uh, compute in a slightly non-standard way as follows. You can compute it by thinking about the uh, um, the maps to the um, the, ma uh, the maps to x in the following way. You think about it as uh, studying maps to the free quotient, which is um, which is T star uh, rep, rep representations of, the, of a quiver, and then projecting to gauge invariant configuration. And this projection to gauge invariant configuration leads you to integ integrating of the maximal torus of the quiver group. So you get an integral formulation of K theoretic vertex function. At the level of that integral formulation of K theoretic vertex function, you can take a limit. Uh, and get, take a conformal limit and get something that still makes sense. And what you find is that in the limit, um, you get integral solutions of finishing the logical equation. Uh, the function w um, that enters these integral solutions in this form is the lambda Gisberg potential, while omega is the top form of y. So um, the the potential you can um, discover it one way or another, either from this prescription or um, uh, it has it has a simple form that you can simply read off from the quiver. And I don't have time to describe how it goes, but knowing just which quiver you can study, you can write it, you can write it down, both the potential and the target. So what you do to rediscover is integral representations of um, conformal blocks of the F on Lie algebra that are well known and go to work with Frank Allen. Anyway, but um, the fact that um, the lambda Gisberg integrals um, gives you um, solutions of, of finishing similar equation, which also happens to be quantum differential equation of abstract, gives um, a given self style proof of two dimensional mirror symmetry, a genus zero. Related equivariant, a relating equivariant A model of abstract with a B la model lambda Gisberg theory, uh, which potential y and uh, with potential y, <coughs> with target y and potential w. Anyway, so from lambda Gisberg perspective, the meaning of this amplitude is the partition function of B-twisted theory on an infinitely long cigar with uh, a type boundary condition at infinity corresponding to choice of integration cycle, which is a Lagrangian in, in the target. Um, so, um, um, so um, which so again, which solution of one of Knizhny's homological equation you get is a choice of a brain at infinity, and this a brain is an object of the chiasidal category of a brains on y uh, of a brains in in the lambda Gisberg model on y with potential w. So um, the categorical are linked invariants then are um, <coughs> floor of cohomology groups. So you get a theory which is bi-graded. Um, the, 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 the second grading that's crucial to get not invariants is a winding number that's associated with the, to the fact that uh, you probably missed because I passed through it too fast, that it's super potential, that the lambda Gisberg potential is not single value. <coughs> Now, it turns out that there is a third approach to categorification, which is uh, related to the other two, um, but it's less tractable. And um, so, okay, well, I, so um, it, 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 it's, um, it's important to explain what it is, because um, uh, we'll, uh, we'll see that, in fact, the third approach and these other two come from the same place in Singapore. And, and finally, um, the, the fact that three-dimensional gauge theories and the Coulomb and Higgs branches 
has something to do with not their husband, a parent in the literature for a long time. Well, as, um, it's kind of surprising the three-dimensional supersymmetric gauge theories should have anything to do with uh, invariance of a perfectly bosonic transonic theory. So anyway, so, um, so the string theory that underlies this is something called the little string theory, um, labeled by a simply least Lie algebra, the same Lie algebra that I was distorted from the beginning. And you can get it as a um, certain limit of a six dimensional, of a full 10 dimensional string theory on an eight on, on a surface singularity. Uh, okay. How much time will they give me? What are you willing to do? Uh, <laughs> four minutes. Oh, okay. All right, so um, from string theory perspective, um, the Cooper formal blocks are supersymmetric partition functions of string theory with D-rings. Okay. So you want to take a six-dimensional string on, um, on, uh, of two-zero type on a six-manifold, which is a product of the Riemann surface where the conformal blocks live. D, it's this infinite cigar that, um, that was the, the domain of Gravel-Witten theory, times another complex plane that's auxiliary, that was um, of, that, that was abstract in so far. Okay. Um, <clears throat> the vertex operators on the Riemann surface come from collections of D rings in the little string theory that are uh, that are located exactly where the vertex operators are. So the D rings that are needed um, are two dimensional defects. They are, they are supported on this uh, on this D, the domain curve of Gramov theory and lambda gate group model. They are at points on the Riemann surface, and they are at the origin of this auxiliary complex plane. Okay. Um, <clears throat> now, um, so which comp the, we had to we have to make a choice of which conformal blocks and which not invariants we want to study. So this will translate into which defect. Okay. So it turns out that the theory on the defect is a quiver gauge theory, uh, with the quiver that arose in the talk earlier, and the connection between quiver gauge theories and D-brains that, that we're using here is something that's a very basic piece of string theory. So there's nothing exotic that happens. Now, <clears throat> the theory on the D on this, uh, the, it's actually a three-dimensional gauge theory on D times S1 that I'm <coughs> Because um, in string theory, if you put D-brains and points on a cylinder, you'll get winding modes that go around the circle of the cylinder and the turn a theory which would have been two-dimensional into a three-dimensional theory, because there are infinitely many such modes. Now, um, so a little string theory has no conformal symmetry, and correspondingly, we get a theory with no conformal symmetry, which is based on this quantum affine algebra. But uh, the conformal limit that takes you from quantum affine algebra to ordinary affine Lie algebra turns out to have a fixed string theory meaning. It's a point particle limit, in which a theory of strings becomes a point, becomes just a quantum field theory in six dimensions, uh, which turns out to have conformal symmetry. And moreover, in this point particle limit, all the winding modes that made your defects three-dimensional um, um, become heavy, and the theory on defects becomes two-dimensional. Now, um, so uh, from the, uh, from the uh, theory on defects of um, so what the description of theories of defects in the six-dimensional conformal field theory was uh, was not really known before. Um, you, you could guess, but you didn't really know for sure. Um, on this way, we derive it uh, from uh, starting with defects of little string theory and taking conformal point particles. So we get two descriptions, one based on uh, maps to um, X check with equivariant mass deformation, and the other based on the lambda gisbert model. Anyway, so, so in both of these descriptions, you start by asking what's the theory on the defect. Now, we could ask, there's another approach which starts by describing the six dimensional physics from the ball. And that's due to uh, Whitney. So, uh, compactified in a very, so it goes like this. Um, so, we take the conformal limit, and in the ball, we get a six dimensional two zero theory. Um, the six-dimensional two-zero theory doesn't have any kind of simple description um, in six dimensions. But if you compactify it on a circle, it becomes a, um, a G-type gauge theory. 
So the circle you want to compactify the theory on is a circle in this extra complex plane. Okay. So it's a funny circle to compactify the theory on because it's contractible. And the result of that is um, the, the, you get a five-dimensional gauge theory on a manifold with a bound. So, a gauge theory has um, an effective description as a gauge lambda Gisbert model on uh, D, which is part of the uh, space time, uh, where the fact that you started with a five dimensional theory on the space makes the theory, effective theory on D, have infinite dimensional target space um, corresponding to uh, complex GC connections on, on this man C manifold with a boundary and suitable bond. Uh, with Jensheim, with potential, which is the Jensheim. Okay, so uh, so this is um, but so uh, so this so so uh, just to end up to to obtain not homology to finish to get not homology groups in this approach, um, you would basically construct floor homology groups uh, based on this lambda Gisbert theory on an infinite dimensional target. Group. So this is. Um, so all three different constructions describe the same physics, just from different perspectives. So, thank you. Thank you. Uh, any questions? Yes. Why do you say the first thing is called is and the second is called Good. The first thing is called uh, um, how is comments are up to details, whether there is some complication of X check that enters or not. But essentially, the fact that you just study um, the same Dirac space. Okay, that's so it's exactly the same. But code is can uh, the same space. Good, very good. Okay, so this is the thing that got lost. So, so, so the Seidel Smith story is actually takes place on the mirror, uh, on the mirror of X check. Now, X check is, is holomorphic symplectic. When it's smooth, it's hyperkeal. In a hyperkeal setting, mirror symmetry takes. Uh, mirror symmetry takes the space to exactly the same space. Okay, so it doesn't do anything. That is why the saddle smith target is the same. Yet, what they study on the target space are A rings. So, they, so their prescription for categorification is um, to study Foucault category of A rings on X check. Okay? Now, in our story, the, but in saddle smith story, the big problem is how to introduce Q. The theory is not great. It doesn't lead to Kovano homology, it leads to symplectic Kovano homology without a grade. So how to introduce a grading in Foucault in this in, in on, on so in our description, we work equivariantly at the outset. The equivariant rotation so and in some sense, um, um so working equivariantly, um the the uh, to introduce Q. You're, um, you're, you're essentially making half of the directions of X check massive. And um, the lambda Gisbert theory is simply, the way you get the lambda Gisbert theory is simply by integrating out these massive directions. That's why in the, um, the lambda Gisbert potential basically has Q, or the kappa, sets right there in front of the potential. That this lambda Gisbert description makes sense only in the equivariant setting. So, and um, uh, so you, you can think of it as follows, that essentially working equivariantly, um, <coughs> you can trade X check for its core, which is basically some union of polymorphic Lagrangians. And, um, and the lambda Gisbrook theory would have been mirrored even without equivariant um, deformation of just the core. With equivariant deformation knowing the core, you, you can actually describe the whole thing. Um, it's, okay. uh, so I should say, um, okay, I, I didn't have time to describe this here, but um, this really works. So, for example, um, uh, from this um, from the lambda Gisbert description, so again, you're you're kind of integrating half the direction of of, of Seidel and Smith, leaving only the theory um, sort of on the on, on, on the space of half dimensional space. Um, now. Um, if you wanted to um, study the draft category in that in that setting, um, na naively there's some tension there, right? Um, if you if you certainly if you work non-equivariantly, um, um, the the categories of full space and its core are not the same. Right? 
And uh, the Lambda Ginsburg theory is so in type A exactly corrects for that. For example, you derive Bigelow's prescription for computing the Jones polynomial, which is kind of a, I can tell you this. This is a story <coughs> in the tone um, of exactly how it works in example. So for, for A1, one, one can actually work it out. So both the mirror symmetry and the derived and the um, Okai side. side. And, The decategorification of it is uh, the Bigelow's description for the, for the Jones polynomial. The categorification of it is um, there's, a, there's a, um, um, a story that Manolescu noticed. In fact, when he was explaining how to think of the Seidel Smith construction, um, he sort of um, noticed that you can actually, that, um, um, that there's sort of a half dimensional theory that gives Bigelow a description for computing the Jones polynomial right away. What he was missing is some something to actually to attach to this half-dimensional description. What one should actually do, and the half-dimensional target is that of the lambda Gisbert theory, and the theory comes alive when you turn on the potential. Other questions? Okay, let's thank Dean again. <laughs>